Amen. One of the shows that I like to watch on TV is Deadliest Catch. How many of you have ever seen this? Deadliest Catch? I think most of us like to watch this because we like to eat crabs. Uh, but I like to watch it because I'm a fisherman. I have a small boat, so it, you could kind of relate to, to what they go through, just, just to a point. Because these guys go, go through some crazy stuff. Um, they, they have these, first of all, these huge crab pots that are, you know, weigh hundreds of pounds, and they, they need to hoist it up with all kinds of equipment. And if that weren't hard enough, they, they do this in, in storms, in bad weather. And whenever you watch them, it's interesting that they are so calm. It, all in a day's work, you know, par for the course. Um, no, no, no problem. Why is that? Because they're professionals. They're seasoned fishermen. They know what they're doing. But when even seasoned fishermen get scared of a storm, then you know it's time to go home. In the passage that we read, we find some seasoned fishermen who were scared. In fact, it says, and a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. And it says, but he was in the stern asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Even these seasoned fishermen were afraid. They were anxious. And you find that, that feeling of anxiety, that, that feeling of fear, is very common today in this country. Max Lucado, in his book, Anxious for Nothing, says, according to the National Institute of Mental Health, anxiety disorders are reaching epidemic proportions. In a given year, nearly 50 million Americans will feel the effects of a panic attack, phobias, or other anxiety disorders. Anxiety disorders in the United States are the number one mental health problem among women and are second only to alcohol and drug abuse among men. People in this country need peace. We need peace, especially this year, because of all the horrible things that have been happening. Now we, we see floods in Houston and in Puerto Rico. Uh, we see devastating fires uh, here in, uh, a few weeks ago, and then now in Southern California. We've had mass shootings in Las Vegas and in Texas and a church of all things. And so people are looking for peace. Uh, in our church this year, I've done more funerals this year than in any year that I've been pastor of this church. I've been pastor of this church for 28 years. This year, I've done more funerals than in any other year. In fact, you just heard two today of members who lost loved ones. We are looking for peace. And if you're looking for peace, then, th then this, this series, this message is for you this morning. In this passage, you find the disciples discovered an important lesson about Jesus and how they can have peace in what's called the Sea of Galilee. This is Israel. This is the Dead Sea in the south, the Jordan River that flows south. This is the Sea of Galilee up north. The sea, sea of Galilee is not very big, actually. It's only 13 miles from north to south and only about 8 miles wide at its widest point from east to west or from west to east. And the disciples and Jesus were ministering in a town called Capernaum up there in the north. They take a boat in the evening to go down south to the region of Gerasim. And while they were in the middle of the lake, the storm hits, this huge storm that frightened the disciples but you find that that the storm doesn't surprise jesus in fact he sent them out in that lake knowing full well that in the middle of that journey there will be a storm and he did that because he wanted to teach them some lessons about who he is as messiah four things about the lord jesus christ that we learned if you're looking for peace four things about jesus that i want you to see this morning. First of all, you see the command of Jesus. The command of Jesus. 
If you and I are going to experience peace, we need to learn to listen to Jesus' words. It says in verse 35, On that day when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. Jesus had been ministering all day. He, had, he was on a boat preaching to a crowd. If this was the lake, uh, he took a boat and moved away from the crowd, and the crowd were on the seashore. After preaching the whole day, he was exhausted, he was tired, and he tells the disciples, let us go over to the other side. It's very important to listen to what Jesus says because many times we get anxious because we don't listen correctly. Notice that Jesus said, let us go over to what? The other side. He did not say, let us go to the middle and drown. If you would listen to the words of Jesus, you will experience more peace in your life. Jesus took special care not only to to preach to the crowd, but to even mentor or teach the disciples in private. Notice what it says in verse 33. This was the beginning of our scripture reading. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them without a parable, but privately. Notice they had tutoring. But privately to his own disciples, he explained everything. Now, you might ask, If these disciples heard what Jesus said, then why did they freak out when the storm hit? Why did they get bent out of shape when all of a sudden the boat was being rocked by the waves? Let me submit to you that it's one thing to listen to Christ's words. It's another thing to live it out. What does the Bible say? Do not merely be hearers of the word, but what? Doers of the word. Our problem is not that we don't listen. Our problem is that we, we, we listen, but we really don't hear. We listen, but we really don't apply. We listen, but it really doesn't make any difference in our lives. Again, Max Locato says, if your belief system is strong, you will stand. If it is weak, the storm will prevail. Belief always precedes behavior. What you believe will determine how you behave. Let me say that again. What you believe, especially what you believe about the Lord Jesus Christ, will determine how you behave. It will determine how you react when the storms of life hit. He says to change the way a person responds to life, Change what a person believes about life. The most important thing about you is your belief system. That's the most important thing. What do you think of when you say the word God? What do you believe about God? What you believe determines how you behave. One of the challenges for us as Christians is to continually be in the word of God. Psalm 1 verse 1 says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked. Now, what do you listen to? We get bent out of shape because we ask advice from people who don't know the Lord, from people who don't know the word of God. He says, who who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. So that is what you are to get rid of when you are a believer. But what are you to now Put on. What are you now to cultivate? What, what are you now to pursue? It says in verse 2, but his what? His delight is in the law of the Lord. Now, notice we are to read, we are to listen, but we need to do something else. It says, and on his law, he meditates day and night. What does it mean to meditate? It means to mull it over. It means not only to hear, But to think, well, how do I live out this truth? How does this truth apply to my situation at work? How does this truth apply to my homework in school that I'm worried about? The test that's coming up, the SAT that I need to to get a good score. And how does this word, this truth, apply to how I live? 
So we not only need to listen Jesus, to Jesus' words, we need to live it out. We need to live it out. Now, what's the blessing? It says in verse 3, He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. You want to be blessed. You want to withstand the storms of life. You want to withstand the droughts of life. It says his leaf does not wither. Why? Because he delights in the word. He meditates on the word so that he could live it out. That's why it says he is blessed. We need to listen. If you want to be less stressed in your life, you need to listen to what Jesus says, and you need to live it out. Here's a promise in Psalm 119, 165. Let's read it together. Great peace have those who love your law. Nothing can make them stumble. Did you hear that? What is the secret? Not only to peace, but great peace. It is to love God's word. It is to love the Bible. It is to make sure that your hearts and minds are saturated with scriptures. Great peace have they who love your law. Do you love God's law? Do you listen to it? Do you live it out? You want to be less stressed, you need to listen. It says your anxiety decreases as your understanding of your father increases. Let me, let me read that again. Your anxiety decreases as your understanding of your father increases. The mind cannot at the same time be full of God and full of fear. If you're afraid, if you're anxious, it's because you have not filled your heart and mind with God's word. How do you know about God? How do you know God more, more intimately? It's by reading God's word. You want to be less stressed. You need to listen to God's word, and you need to live it out. Jesus says, let's get over to what? The other side. Not in the middle and drown. Okay. Secondly, you find not only the command of Jesus, you find the care of Jesus. What is the temptation whenever you're going through storms in life? The big temptation is to say, God, if you cared about me, I would not be going through this. God, why is it that, that I'm going through this problem? Why do I have financial problems? Why are my kids not listening to me? Why is it that my husband doesn't pay attention to me? Lord, don't you what? Care. Don't you care? And that's exactly what the disciples said. Notice what they said in verse 38. Teacher, do you not care? You ever tempted to say to God, to say to Jesus, Jesus, don't you care? Don't you see what I'm going through? And that's a temptation when storms of life come. Now, why, why did they say that? Okay, let's go back a little bit. Verse 37, why did they say, why did they charge Jesus of not caring? Verse 37, it says, and a great windstorm arose and the waves were breaking into the boat so that the boat was already filling. Now, if you're in a boat and water is coming into the boat, your tendency is to panic. That ever, it happened to me one time. Uh, I just got an aluminum boat, and Alan and I were, were, were going fishing at San Pablo. And, of course, you're a rookie. You don't know. You're, you don't know all the things, all the steps. And you're just happy to be able to back it up straight into the on the launch. And, and you go there. We were all excited. All of a sudden, we saw water was going to the boat. We forgot to put the plug at the back. <laughs> It's like, oh, no, you know, you're, you're panicking. You don't know what to do. And, and that was on a calm day. It was sunny. But when water starts going into the boat, your tendency is to panic. And so they were panicking. Why? Because the water was going in. And then they see Jesus at the back. Oh, first of all, I, I was looking at the fire uh, in South. And they, do you know that they, because it's so bad that they, in invented a new word instead of code red they kicked it up a notch did you hear what it's code it's called it's code purple it's not that's how bad it is now the disciples were not in a nice sunny day it, it was and their boat was filling up the boat was filling up and it was cold purple 
It was bad. So why did they accuse Jesus of not caring? Well, in verse 38, it says, but he was in the stern, what? Asleep, <laughs> maybe even snoring, right? And they woke him up and said to him, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? So they're bailing water and, and they're, they're looking around and Jesus is just in the back going, you know, and they're going, oh, and they wake him up and they don't wake him up gently. They don't say, oh, uh, Jesus, excuse me, Jesus, could you wake up, please? No, they wake him up with attitude. Wake up, Jesus. Don't you care that we're perishing? Why don't you help, help us bail out some water? Do you not care? <laughs> you ever say something that you regret? Have you ever said something that wish, you wish you could take back? Or is it just me? <laughs> you know, looking back, in retrospect, could you imagine the disciples years later talking about, you know how it is when you, you're sitting around and, and you're talking about what happened in the past. Maybe they're around the campfire. Hey, do you remember that time we were in the lake? And they remember when you said, Jesus, don't you care? Oh, yeah, man, that's so embarrassing. I shouldn't have said that. But, but you think about it. You think about what they were accusing Jesus of. Jesus, don't you care? And many times... We say the same thing, don't we? We accuse Jesus of not caring. What did Jesus say when he was here on earth? He says, greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Whenever we're anxious, you know what we do? We diminish the love of God for us. We, we say that whenever we say, Lord, don't you care? You know what we're saying? Lord, you don't love us. And whenever that happens, my advice to you is to look to the cross. Because when Jesus was here, he says, greater love, greater love has no one than this, that what? Someone lay down his life for his friends. That Jesus loves you so much that he went up willingly on that cross so that he could die for your sins and my sins. And how, how is it that we could then turn around when we have these small storms in our lives and, and accuse them of not caring? He says, I, I love you so much that I'm willing to die for you. Whenever we think or tempted to think that Jesus doesn't care, remember the cross. Remember the cross. Now, the text doesn't say, but... If I were to guess which disciple said this, you know who it would be? Peter. <laughs> I think it would be Peter. Do you know what Peter writes in 1 Peter 5, 7? Let's read this together. Casting all your anxieties on him because what? Oh, he cares for you. Did he learn this lesson? Yes. <laughs> Casting all your cares upon him. Why? Because he cares for you. That during the times when it seems like he's sleeping, he cares for you. He loves you. He knows what you're going through. And whatever it is that you're going through, it does not take him by surprise. And our response, whenever it is that, that, we are, that we are tempted to say, Jesus, don't you care, is to remember the cross. Now, there's a verse in Psalm, I skipped it, but in Psalm 4, 8, it says, in peace, I will both lie down and sleep for you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. Why was Jesus sleeping? <clears throat> because he trusted in God's protection. He trusted in God's care. And we need to have the same attitude. You know, we have so many problems that keep us awake at night. No, just, just cast all your cares upon him and go to sleep. Turn off the TV. Turn off your phones. Go to sleep. That's why we're so anxious. We don't get enough sleep sometimes. It's that simple. We wake up tired. No, trust God. It says, I, in peace, I will both lie down and sleep. The Bible says God gives sleep to those whom he loves. Psalm 127. Trust God. And so we need to, to look at the, the command of Christ, learn to listen and learn to live out 
Secondly, we need to, to understand or resist the temptation of thinking that, that Jesus doesn't care whenever we're going through the storms of life. Uh, third, in this passage, if we're going to have less anxiety, uh, look at the calm that the disciples received from Jesus. Jesus is sovereign over every storm of your life. Let me say that again. Jesus is sovereign. He is more powerful than any storm in your life. In verse 39, it says, And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased. And there was a great calm. First of all, it's interesting to note that he used the word or he rebuked the wind. Who do you rebuke? Do you rebuke nature or do you rebuke people? People, right? But this word rebuke and this word be still was used in the first chapter when he was casting out a demon. It says in verse 25 of chapter 1, but Jesus, here's the word, rebuked him. And then he used the same word, be silent or be still and come out of out of him. The word be, be silent means be muscled, be still, be quiet. And there's an implication here that there was something supernatural going on. That Satan wanted to get rid of the disciples and Jesus. And so he sensed this storm to, to, this, to this lake. That's something that was very unusual. So much so that seasoned fishermen were, were afraid. But whether it's supernatural or it's natural, Jesus has it under control. He says in verse 39, peace, be still. And it says, and the wind, what? Cease, this howling wind, all of a sudden stop. This raging sea that was lapping over the, the sides of the boat, all of a sudden became still. All of a sudden, the, the sea was like glass. All of a sudden, you could see the reflection of the stars and the moon on that, on that lake. It says, and there was a what? Great calm. Not just, he didn't just reduce it to its tolerable so that they could row, row back. What it says, there was great calm. So much so the disciples were in awe. They, they were in awe. It says, there was great calm. You see, the problem was not the storm. The problem was that the disciples didn't understand who was in the boat with them. Who was in the boat with them? Jesus. Who is Jesus? He's the creator of the universe. And so as long as Jesus was in the boat, the boat was unsinkable. When Jesus is in the boat, the boat is unsinkable. Repeat that after me. When Jesus is in the boat, the boat is is unsinkable. Turn to your neighbor and tell them, when Jesus is in the boat, the boat is unsinkable. Now, you said that like you didn't believe it. So I want you to turn out to your other neighbor and say that with them, and say that to them with conviction. When Jesus is in the boat, the boat is unsinkable. Okay, that sounded better. When Jesus is in the boat, the boat is unsinkable. So my question to you this morning is this. Who is in your boat? Is Jesus in your boat? When Jesus is in the boat, the boat is unsinkable. The problem many times is even though he's in our boat, we're not aware of his presence. When Jesus called the disciples, he didn't say, all right, go and preach. You know what he did? Look at the order. It says, and he appointed the 12 whom he also named apostles so they might be, here's the key word, with him. And he might send them out to preach. That before they go out on their mission, before they go out on their preaching schedule, they needed to understand who their master was. They needed to spend time with Jesus. They needed to be aware of his presence in their lives and learn from him. 
The more we're aware of Jesus' presence in our lives, the more intimately acquainted we are with him, the less stressed we would be when storms hit our lives. So become aware of his presence. It's it's in his presence that our problems disappear. It's in his presence that we get a proper perspective of the storms that we're going through. When Jesus, who's the creator of the universe, is in our lives, then he has it under control. We might not be able to control it, but God has things under control. Jesus is sovereign over everything that we're going through. And whatever it is that you're scared of this morning, whatever it is that you're anxious about, know that Jesus is sovereign even over that problem. When Jesus is in the boat, the boat is unsinkable. Finally, we get the challenge from Jesus the challenge from Jesus. And this is our challenge today. This is our challenge not only today. This is going to be our challenge for the next couple of months as we study this whole topic of peace. In verse 40, he said to them, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And Jesus is saying, have you not listened to me and heard my sermons and gone through private tutoring? Have you not seen my miracles? Have you not seen how I've cared for you daily? He says, do you still, do you still not see? Do you still have no faith? Why are you so afraid? Verse 41, and they were filled with great fear and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? They were more scared of Jesus than the storm. Because it says they were filled with what? Great fear. Says, Why are you so afraid of the storm? But when Jesus, when Jesus did what he did, they, they were filled with great fear. In, in Greek, it's cowardly fear, actually. It's, it's actually the word. It was great fear. Why? Because even though they believed that Jesus is the Messiah, there were certain things that they were not aware of. They did not understand that Messiah... It's not only the one who would deliver Israel, that Messiah is God. That Jesus is not only the Son of God, He is God, the Son. And they had to learn this. And it took a storm for them to begin to realize who Jesus is. That's why when we go through storms, understand, it is simply an opportunity for Jesus to demonstrate His great power in your life. So so don't get bent out of shape when you're going through a storm. Look for it as an opportunity to trust Christ. Look for it as an opportunity for him to reveal new things about himself that you did not already know. And here the storms of life, the storms in the Sea of Galilee stretched the faith of the disciples. It began to give them a a bigger view of who Jesus is. He says, they said, who is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? You know why they said that? Because in the Old Testament, The ability to calm down a storm was attributed to God himself. It says in Psalm 89, verse 8, O Lord, God of hosts, who is as mighty as you are. In other words, there's no one like you. O Lord, with your faithfulness all around you, you rule the raging of the sea when its waves rise and you still them. Did you see that? The... the, The Jewish people believe that only God can still a storm, and yet Jesus did it. Psalm 107, verse 28, Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He made the storms to be still, and the waves of the sea were hushed. And they were glad that the waters were quiet, and he brought them to their desired haven. Only God can do that. And so when the disciples saw Jesus do that, they said, Who is he that even the waves and the winds obey him? The more you understand who Jesus is, the less anxious you will be in your life. The problem is not the storm. The problem is many times we do not understand we do not really believe who it is that's in the boat with us. Security is based not on how how distant we could be 
from the storm, but how close we could be to our Savior. That's where security lies. It doesn't matter what's, what's going on around us. If Jesus is with us, that is where our security is found. And that when the storms of life comes, that our, our first response is not, well, let me row as fast as I can to the shore. It is let me rest in my Savior. The more you know who God is, the less anxious you will be about your situation. This passage, we find the command of the Lord Jesus Christ. Learn to listen. He didn't say go to the middle and drown. He said, let's get to the other side. Listen, but not only listen, live out the words of God as you meditate on it. We see the care of Jesus Christ. Don't fall to the, the temptation of thinking that God doesn't care when you're going through storms. Casting all your cares upon him because he cares for you. And that whenever you're tempted, whenever you're, you're discouraged and think, wow, Jesus, are you sleeping? Don't you care? Remember the cross. Greater love has no one than this, that he gives his life for his friends. No, understand that Jesus is sovereign over the storms of your life. The calm from Jesus. Whatever it is that you're going through, Jesus is more than a match for that storm, for that problem. For that situation. And finally, we see the challenge from Jesus. He says, why are you so scared? Why do you have so little faith? And the disciples actually gave us the challenge for the series. Who is this man? Who is he that even the waves and the winds listen to him? The more you know who Jesus is, the more you understand that he is the prince of peace, the more you will experience the peace that he offers, the peace that passes all understanding. I will trust Jesus during the storms of my life because he cares for me. Have you experienced that care? Would you like to? If today you've come and you've heard about Jesus, but maybe you've never invited him into your life. I want to give you an opportunity to do that as we close in prayer. Let's all bow our heads and close our eyes. And if today you've come and, and you're, you're feeling tossed about and anxious and afraid because of the problems that you're going through, understand that Jesus loves you. He died on the cross for your sins and mine so that we could have eternal life, so that we could have a, have a relationship with him. And so in the quietness of this moment, if you'd like to ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, I invite, him, I invite you to pray this prayer with me. Just quietly where you're at, just say, Dear Lord Jesus, I need you. I believe you died on the cross for my sins, was buried, and the third day rose again. I hear right now put my faith in you alone as my Lord and as my Savior. Come into my life and save me. Thank you, Lord, for anyone who prayed that prayer. And I pray, Father, that you would help them to grow in their understanding of who you are, who your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, is. That as they put their trust in you, as they put their, their trust in your son, Lord, that they would experience your peace that passes all understanding. Maybe you're a believer and you've come today and you're going through a storm. And it seems like Jesus is sleeping. Would you just come to him right now and just say, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me for thinking that you don't care, that you're, you're not aware of what I'm going through. Forgive me for not believing that you're able, that you're sovereign over this problem. And so just come to him right now and just can uh, once again tell him how much you love him. Once again, thank him for the peace that he's able to give, this, the peace that this world could never give and the storms of this life could never take away. Thank him for that peace and claim that peace right now. Father, I thank you for speaking to us. I thank you, Lord, for um, using this simple and familiar story to renew our, our spirits, to refresh us, to, to strengthen our faith in you. And I just commit to you, Lord, the people right now who are in this congregation who are experiencing uh, deep problems that are known only to you. 
I pray, Father, that you would reassure them of your grace and your mercy and your power that's deeper than anything that they're going through. I pray especially, Lord, for, for uh, Sister Barbara and, Lord, uh, the Benaya family who have lost their, their grandma, their mom, and Sister Barbara who lost her, her brother. I pray, Father, that you, would, that you would comfort them, that, Father, you would minister to their hearts. I pray these things in Jesus' name.